what I'm going to do is to uh, the main topic that I'm planning to look at is the AXI bus, right? Uh, AXI is one particular bus which is used for interfacing between CPUs and peripherals, okay? So before I get into that and why we need to sort of understand what the AXI bus is and what it is capable of doing, it's a good idea to sort of understand why we need to understand buses in the first place, right? And the main reason behind that is to sort of come to, you know, I mean, uh, because uh, so far we started out by saying that we were going to design or rather most of the things that we were looking at were how do we design customized hardware to solve specific problems, right? So let's say that we have a filter application. We looked at different ways of doing it. One is a direct full hardware implementation. The other is a folded implementation using a limited amount of hardware. The other extreme was to go for a parallel implementation where I have multiple copies of the hardware and so on. Okay. In each of those cases, the assumption is that I have some input which is being streamed into the system that I want to implement, namely the filter. The filter performs a fixed type of operation and finally it generates certain output. Okay. Now, in practice, very often, what we want is something more complicated than that, right? An example could be that, let's say that we are trying to implement a 5G uh, transceiver system. One of the things that we would be interested in would be, can I get a accelerator just for performing FFT operations, right, for your transforms, okay? What is the reason for this? Because the 5G, the way that the waveform is defined, it basically relies on creating Fourier transforms of large sequences of data, okay? Now, of course, it's possible to write C code for a Fourier transform. In fact, by using modern processors, you can probably write very efficient C code, right? And in fact, if you start looking at, you know, the kind of uh, system that is present in a Intel Core processor or a Xeon processor, it has a significant amount of parallel hardware as well, meaning that, you know, it has several different multiply accumulate units and you can do vector instructions and so on. Now, already that is reaching the point at which, you know, you've got a fairly complex architecture. And the question might then become, how would I take my Fourier transform code and map it onto that architecture, right? What's an efficient way of mapping it like that? So, you know, the example was what we covered last time, the velocity architecture from TI, the C6000. And we saw that, you know, something as simple as a dot product in order to map it efficiently onto that TIC 6000 architecture, you need to really understand the architecture as well as some principles of how the dependencies between the different operations can be handled. Okay. On the other hand, let's say that your processor is fundamentally not capable of doing too much computation, right? It's a relatively low end processor without too many fancy features and you want to keep it that way. You want to basically keep it so that it does not consume too much power. It does not uh, occupy too much area and it's basically not very expensive. In such a situation, what can usually happen is that we say, okay, let me keep the core processor as simple as possible. And then for all the customized operations that I want, I will use accelerators. Right? So this is basically the approach that we are using is that we can use custom accelerators for specific operations that a processor needs to do, right? And in such a situation, the sort of uh, hardware model that we are working with looks something like this. I have a CPU, the central processing unit, which needs to communicate with memory. So what I have over here is this bidirectional arrow that I have drawn is essentially going to be something which has address and data and control, right? Control is basically read or write, essentially in this case, right? It's as simple as that. Which means that the way that I will be using this bus will be that at any given point in time when the CPU wants to retrieve data from some location in memory, it puts out an address on the address bus and it gives a read signal as part of the control, okay? And after a certain amount of time, which ideally would be like, you know, the very next clock cycle, but it may be much longer. It could be like uh, several cycles in the case of, you know, DRAM access, or it might be maybe, you know, two or three cycles in the case of L2 or L3 cache access, right? 
But either way, the point is that you have something which basically gives back the data after some time. Okay. Now, obviously, you can already imagine that you know if the memory is going to respond in the very next clock cycle, that's perfect, right? I just give a read signal and the address, and in the very next clock cycle, I have the data. I don't need to wait for anything. On the other hand, if the memory takes exactly three clock cycles always, that's also all right. The CPU can basically just issue a read request and wait for three clock cycles and then capture the data, right? That is sort of what is happening in the C6000, right? I mean, it knows that a load operation has exactly a four cycle latency, okay? So after four dead cycles, I will have the data in my register. That's the assumption that we make. Those are deterministic systems. On the other hand, what if my memory system has caches L1, L2, L3 and main memory which is DRAM, right? All of which basically have different latencies and in particular the DRAM could have a non-deterministic latency, right? Depending on whether it's in the middle of a refresh cycle or whether it has just, you know, got the data currently already at the right page, the amount of time that it takes to return the data from memory would be very different, okay? What that means is this control could be more complicated, right? I might need additional signals which basically indicate data valid or wait, okay? Those are examples that I can think of, okay? All of this is so that you can talk from between the CPU and memory. The CPU can request data from memory and it can write data into memory, okay? But obviously that's not the end of the story. What I also have in addition to this is a set of peripherals. So what are these peripherals? It could be anything. In the case of a general CPU, it could be the video display, keyboard, mouse, network interface, or it could be A to D converters, D to A converters, streaming data from somewhere, right? Anything of this sort. There could be multiple sources of data or sinks of data, each of which basically can be considered as a peripheral, okay? So when I say peripheral, the one thing to keep in mind over here is we are interested in signal processing systems, which means that our definition of peripheral is now a little bit more expanded than what a typical PC would be, right? Normally when you talk about PC, the peripherals that you're interested in are keyboard, mouse, monitor, and maybe a printer, okay? Whereas in our case, we might also be interested in other kinds of systems, uh, you know, uh, direct interface of a high-speed A to D or D to A converter, uh, some kind of... Uh, high bandwidth interface between multiple cards, right? Or some way by which a video capture card, maybe a video camera, right? Lots of those things could also be peripherals which are of interest for a signal processing system, okay? Now the question that arises in such a case is, how should I communicate with these peripherals? Now, if you go back to the old Intel processors or actually Intel processors, I think still have those kind of uh, instructions in them. But uh, generally speaking, they, what they did is, they said that we will treat peripherals as something different from memory, okay? Meaning that as far as memory is concerned, I can read or write a certain memory location and it will give me back the data, right? And if I want to communicate with a peripheral, I have to use a totally different instruction, a machine instruction. Okay, so there will be something like an IO instruction, which basically says IO.read or IO.write. And again, I will have this concept of addressing, right? So the concept of addressing is still there. But now I'll have a different address for each of these peripherals, right? And in fact, why just have one address? I could have an address range which basically says that if I am trying to communicate with across some certain range of addresses, it means that the target is the video display, right? So for example, one of the things that would be done is, I would say that some number of memory location, not memory locations, address locations corresponds to the video display. And if I write something to one of those locations, it will update a pixel on the screen. Similarly, there will be some other address which corresponds to the keyboard. And if I read from that address, it will give me back what was the last key that was pressed, okay? So those kinds of things are how the addresses are used even in the case of the video display, right? Now, obviously you can see the similarities over here now, right? I mean, why, why am I distinguishing between memory and peripherals? After all, the way that I would need to communicate with both of them, there would be addresses, there would also be data flowing back and forth, 
right? And there would be control signals. Once again, it would be things like read or write, whether data is valid, whether I need to wait, and so on. Okay, which basically means that the way that I communicate with peripherals is essentially the same as the way that I would communicate with arbitrary memory location. What I can do in that case is to say that I will use this concept called memory mapping. And the memory map essentially says, let me just look at this entire address space of my system. If the address bus is in bits wide, I essentially have locations from 0 up to 2 to the power of n minus 1. Okay, So there are 2 to the power of n minus 1 locations in the address space of my system. Right? This address bus is determined by the CPU. It's not determined by what peripherals or memory are actually available in the system. Right? It's determined by the CPU. So if I have a 32-bit CPU, 32-bit address bus, it means that I can access 2 to the power of 32 minus 1 locations. Okay. Now, you are you would have all heard of this term 64-bit processor, 32-bit processor, and so on. Now, there is a connection between that address bus size and the whether it's a 32-bit processor or a 64-bit processor. Right? Fundamentally, what that 64-bit means is that we are talking, or 32-bit means is that we are talking about the size of the registers that can be used in instructions. Okay. Now, if my registers are of size 32 bits, that usually means that the pointers that I am using will also be something which can fit within one register and therefore is of size 32 bits, which means that my address bus is of size 32 bits. Okay. Now, the reason why I am sort of giving this roundabout explanation over here is because that is not a hard and fast rule. For example, if you look at what the Intel processors did, they came up with this concept called PAE, the physical address extensions, which allowed them, even with a 32-bit processor, to access up to 2 to the power of 40 locations, which means that you could go above 4 GB of RAM on a Intel processor, even with a 32-bit system. Okay. Nowadays, of course, pretty much all systems that we come across, even ARM processors, are 64-bit systems, right? which means two things. One is the address bus is basically 64 bits. Right? which means that the number of addressable locations as far as the processor is concerned is 2 to the power of 64 minus 1, which is some absurdly large number. Right? At least in our lifetimes, I think we are not going to see anywhere close to that. So assume it is infinity, right? just to keep things simple. Uh, also, what it means is that the registers that are available inside the system now need to be capable of storing uh, an address, which means they are 64 bits in size. All this that I've said is the address bus. Okay, The data bus is a different story. Data bus, this determines how much data can be loaded from memory per clock cycle. Okay, So if I say that I have a 128-bit data bus, it means that I can actually load 128 bits of data right, or 16 bytes of data in one clock cycle from the processor into memory. So what I have seen is, let's say that we are dealing with n equal to 32. Okay, so what I basically have is n equal to 32. This would basically be written as hexadecimal FFFF FFFF. Right? So each F over here is 4 bits. So times 8 basically comes out to be 32 bits. Right? So this number is basically equal to 2 to the power of 32 minus 1. Okay. Obviously, I'm considering unsigned numbers, right? I'm not interested in positive and negative since I'm only talking about an address. Now, this is approximately 4 into 10 power 9. Okay. Not all systems with 32 bit processors have or had 4 GB of RAM. Okay. So, what I could do instead is to say that, let's say I have only 1 GB of RAM. Okay, I could basically break this up and say I will choose one section over here and say this is 1 GB and this is the actual RAM. 
right so this essentially corresponds to a large 4g locations you can think of it as 4gb capable so effectively what it means is out of this 4g out only 1gb actually is physical ram that is present in the system so what happens to the rest of it let's say that i try generating an address in this range i would basically say invalid address what does that mean it means that can i prevent the processor from generating such an address no what would happen is the processor would generate such an address put it out onto the address bus and give a read request over there where does that go it basically gets connected to nothing there is nothing physically present that can respond to this right so there are two possibilities one is that there might actually be some kind of a physical controller which takes the address from the address from the processor and decides and and it knows what are the valid and invalid regions of memory and it, and it returns information basically saying this is an invalid address okay in which case the processor can decide what to do right if you are uh, writing a program let's say in a linux system you would uh, know that you know this would result in something called a segmentation violation probably end up crashing your program right hopefully not the entire operating system but it would definitely end up crashing your program saying that you know i tried accessing some memory that was not available nothing could be uh, you know I couldn't get any data and crash okay uh, actually a segmentation violation in linux is something slightly different that is also related to memory protection i'm not talking about all that right i'm talking about the actual physical memory itself right now what this means is right you know this part that i have marked in red is anyway invalid locations and it looks as though most of the rest of it is also invalid right so the question that comes up then is why not make use of that right and let's basically come up with this plan where we say i will just take one section out here right and say this is no longer invalid and i will use for some peripheral what does that mean it basically means that let's say that this address was something like you know 1000 to 2000 okay just think of decimal numbers if the address is in the range 1000 to 2000 right the peripheral should respond and this is an interesting thing to understand what does it actually mean to say the peripheral should respond right after all think about what happens when i try to read from memory i give an address i give a control signal and after a certain amount of time i get back data right and as we already saw if i have something like dram then i actually need a you know ready signal or a wait signal coming back from the dram to indicate that yes this is valid data okay and only then i will be able to read that uh, value back how does the processor actually know that it was dram or you know even memory that responded and not just something else right that is the principle that we are using we are basically saying that as far as the processor is concerned it cannot distinguish between a memory block and some other peripheral as long as data is returned to it right it tries to do a read it gets back something similarly it tries to do a write the data goes somewhere there is no guarantee that when it tries to read back the same data will come back okay that's all that we care about as far as this memory addressing is concerned right effectively what that uh, what we are saying is i have got this memory uh, map right this portion that i have over here and by addressing some part of it at so the peripheral i can basically retrieve or uh, retrieve any any data or send data where i want it to so if this was let's say a network peripheral right a network card writing to this card writing to this address or range of addresses will cause a packet to be sent out on the network think about it effectively what i'm saying is i just have to write to a certain location in memory and suddenly something goes out on the ethernet network right now what will happen if i try reading back from the same memory i don't know i can't say there's no guarantee that the data that i wrote will come back okay in particular reading should hopefully receive data from the network 
okay this is one way of doing it similarly what i could do like i said you know the keyboard after all is a peripheral right so i can just allocate some address location to it and say keep on reading from that location anytime that there is data present over there it means that somebody pressed a key and this was the key that was pressed okay so this idea of memory mapping essentially allows us to unify both the memory as well as the peripherals into one way of communication right it is in this context that the whole idea of a bus comes in okay so what i'm going to do now is with this background i basically want, want to get into what a bus looks like and in particular what is this axi bus that is used in arm related processors okay and you know uh, it may not be limited to arm related processors it uh, in fact what you will find is that it is also heavily used in a lot of other kinds of soc systems nowadays right system on chip uh, platforms nowadays okay so it is starting to become a very popular bus part of the reason for that is just the simplicity of the design 